Welcome to this edition of Critic Show Extra. As we know, a new Muppet movie hit theaters last year, and it was met with some very positive reviews from new and longtime Muppet fans. That included me. And one of the things I often said about this new movie was, it's the best Muppet film since the Muppets Take Manhattan. Juliana Donald was in that movie. She played the cute and friendly waitress, Jenny, who was very much like the girl next door. Her character and the Muppets meet for the first time at her father's diner, Pete's. It's not long before she finds herself spending quality time with Kermit and helping him as he tries to sell his musical, Manhattan Melodies, on Broadway. Even though Juliana went on to appear in a number of television shows like Star Trek The Next Generation, Deep Space Nine, and NYPD Blue, she'll never forget her first film role in the classic Muppet movie. As a fan of those movies, I'm very excited to talk with her today and learn a little more about the experience. Juliana, thanks for being on the show today. It's a real pleasure to talk with you. Well, it's a pleasure to talk to you, too. What's really interesting about the story behind you and this role is that you didn't have a whole lot of familiarity with the Muppets, so maybe there wasn't a means to completely digest the magnitude of getting this role on The Muppets Take Manhattan. Yet this was your first film role, so how do you look back on all of it now? Well, it was all kind of crazy because apparently I didn't know this, but they had been on this nation worldwide talent search for this character and Mm -hmm. apparently had gone through all sorts of stars and I was just called in kind of two days before they were starting shooting the movie you know let's just get everybody that we haven't seen we don't care where they come from and I I went in and interviewed for it and um, I was asked to come back and um, do a scene with Jim and Kermit and I guess they liked how I talked to Kermit, and I actually had to run out that day because I was doing an off-Broadway play. I don't know if I would have got the job if they said, oh, come back, we want to do more scenes or whatever, but I ran out of there, disappeared into the night, and <laughs> I guess they had to make a decision. So it was kind of like craziness because I got a call that night, you're starting Monday morning on this film. I had no idea how any of it worked. So yeah. it was really kind of amazing. The whole experience was very, very magical. So I look back on it as kind of a magical experience. It was magical to work with those people. The whole way they filmed the Muppet movies is magical, building these sets four feet above ground. And um, so if I had to look back on it, the way I got the job, everything was kind of like magic. Wow. Well, and despite a limited familiarity with the Muppets going in, were there certain things that drew you to the role when you found out about it and went through the audition process? The thing about those characters is they're so sweet yeah, and um, genuine. And so to be able to interact with them, it's almost like you're interacting with innocent children. And um, mm-hmm. so... That's like a really wonderful thing because it's kind of pure. It's kind of beautiful. That was something I really, really grabbed onto. Back then, even now, uh, finding a role and finding a film like that is kind of few and far between. It's, you know? it's true. I didn't realize at the time the gift it was. Of course, I realized this in the midst of doing it, but sure. um, ultimately the gift it was to work with Jim because he was such a genius and a master and... He wasn't around much longer after this film. And um, his son came in a couple of times when Jim was doing something he couldn't get out of, play Kermit. And he did a good job, but it wasn't Jim. You know, so in retrospect, I realized what a big deal it was to have stepped into that whole world. Well, and you know, the Muppet movies are also known for their cameo appearances. You had a couple of them in the diner. You had Brooke Shields and I think Elliot Gould came in at one point. Uh, Art right. Carney was uh, Ronnie's dad. And one right. of my favorite scenes, literally, I'm, I find myself talking about this scene a lot that you were kind of at the beginning and end of, is when you and Kermit go jogging, someone steals Miss mm-hmm. Piggy's purse, and then Gregory Hines finds mm-hmm. himself in the middle of that argument about you and mm-hmm. Kermit. Piggy, have you been spying on me? Oh, maybe spying on Vu and that certain young girl of the opposite gender? Oh. Two time and her? Uh, no, no, it's just Jenny. She's a friend. She's a friend. She's been trying to help me sell the show. Ha! He's got to sell the show. What show? Well, if she is just a friend, then what about the the Huggies? What? The Huggies? 
You gave Jenny the huggies? You know, maybe, maybe, Kermit, maybe it would have been better if we had never have met. Then, then you and Jenny would not be tormented by my presence. Oh, See what the huggies will get you. Listen, Jenny and I were hugging because we're friends. Yeah. That's what friends do. Friends do not spy. Yeah, I forgot about that. Did you get to meet any? I mean, you talk about getting your first film role and the neat experience of it all. Did you get a chance to meet some of the big names that had got oh, pulled yeah, into that Oh, yeah, yeah. Everybody, because I was on the set all the time, because it was so, there were so many technical things that even when they weren't shooting my scenes, I was there. But yes, I got to meet them. I'm a dancer, a oh. former ballerina, so Gregory Hines was like one of my all-time idols. So wow. that was a, a great experience. That was my favorite scene, too, because on that particular day, um, they had some problems setting up the cameras, and Jim, who had an incredibly busy schedule, was there to play Kermit, and it was taking a little bit longer than expected. And Jim's assistant kept saying, oh, uh, Jim, come on, you have like this meeting with, I don't know, you know, the Pope, whatever. <laughs> Somebody and, important. Um, <laughs> it, it being like these huge people are waiting for you for the meeting, <laughs> And Jim had Kermit and these little kids in the park just started, like, coming over, and they had their mouths open in shock that mm -hmm. they saw Kermit. Mm -hmm. He did not look that there was a hand coming from Kermit's head into Jim Henson. They were just completely mesmerized by Kermit. And Jim said to his assistant, that's okay. And the assistant kept saying, you know, come on, they're, they're waiting. And he sat there for probably 45 minutes to an hour and did this whole thing talking to the little kids. Wow. And it was really an amazing experience because in that moment you see, wow, this is somebody who's really doing this purely for the love of what they're doing, which has to do with entertaining children. Absolutely. I never saw that again in, in anything I, I did. So it was really my favorite scene, too, for that reason. Yeah, I bet that's just one of those things where you probably have that whole visual in your head like it was yesterday. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you're as you it describe was, it, I can visualize it. Yeah, it was just amazing. You know, it was amazing. And these kids, and he was funny, and he was answering the kids, and it was all improv, and he <laughs> could have done it for five hours. I know? bet. And I have never saw him once, no matter how much stress he had, like even get remotely sad or irritated or anything. He really was a special person. You know, another thing I think it's important to point out, I mean, you've gone on and done several other projects, including NYPD right. Blue and Star Trek, and I right. had a chance to work with all kinds of people, good actors and good people behind the scenes. But with all that experience, I mean, just, just for as, a, as an actress working with uh, somebody like that, what stands out the most about working with Jim? The thing that was interesting about him is there was no ego. I've worked with a lot of famous actors since but I never saw anything like this where it was almost as if he didn't think that he was anything more than just part of a team. Yeah. So, um, and when you went into the Muppet Brownstone where they built all these puppets, it, there were, where they had all these puppet builders and everything, every single person in there was, was just as valued as the next. So the thing that was, to me, the most amazing is here is kind of the captain of the ship who doesn't really act like the captain of the ship. He acts like one of the kind of like, I need everybody else as much, and sure. um, would listen to people and would not be like, oh, we should do it this way. And, you know, because I'm the one that has all the success and I'm the expert, I should know better. Yeah, it would have been very There's easy humility. for him to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Also the fact that that was Frank Oz's first film mm -hmm. and that Jim would give Frank that kind of um, responsibility with not really having any experience. And Jim would come in a lot of times and kind of tell him, well, you should do this, you should do that, but leaving everything up to Frank. You talk about, I mean, obviously two challenges going into this. You mentioned the raised sets. That had to be mm -hmm. challenging initially. You're dealing with puppeteers and Muppets instead of people sometimes. But as mm -hmm. good as everybody was in what they did on that team, like you said, I bet it was only challenging to a certain degree. And because those people were so good at what they did that I bet it was easy to get kind of lost in there in a good way and just kind of run with it and then almost become second nature pretty quickly. Yeah, that's true. I mean, Steve Whitmire, you know, Rizzo the Rat, mm -hmm. and, 
And um, all the puppeteers, they were so talented, and they had so much experience. I never saw anybody get upset with anybody Mm -hmm. or ever, 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 not anyone on the set. So um, that was also extraordinary And um, because there's always somebody that's upset about something, and that never occurred. We had Martin Scorsese's um, parents were extras. Yeah, I they saw that. Like, they wanted to be there every single day because That's everybody amazing. was so nice. So <laughs> they had them come every single day. <laughs> and um, that was like kind of um, nice. So it was like this unusual situation that is really a gift. Everybody that was a part of it, and I think in everybody's life, everybody was, you know, just like, wow, this is a really fun thing to be a part of. You know, we dedicated an entire show to the Muppets last season, and Charles Grodin uh, was in the movie before yours, and uh-huh. he was on, and he, he had kind of a romantic interest of sort in Miss Piggy in the film, and evidently, according to him, some of that carried off screen <laughs> in a way that... Oh, yeah, yeah. In a way um, that he vividly uh, remembers. So you had a little chemistry with Kermit on screen, so did anything carry off the screen? Yeah, Miss Piggy a lot of times would say nasty things to me when the camera was, um, <laughs> when the, they had cut. I'd get quite a few snide remarks. Really? And, uh, or when they were ready to shoot, when Miss Piggy arrived on the set. Uh, I, I kind of kept my distance. Originally, they were going to have it be more of a romance with, we were really going to have like this full-blown romance, but I guess since Frank was, um, directing the film, mm-hmm. he didn't want to, I think, put too much on his emotional preparation for Miss Piggy's hysteria, so they decided to just make it in her mind. I guess she, maybe she was off with Charles Grodin on the, I don't, I don't know. Um, so I bet that made it kind of awkward at times, you know, if you wanted to ask Kermit out for coffee or something during a break. <laughs> it, unless you're okay with somebody 10 feet away giving you dirty looks <laughs> while you're having your coffee. Well, there's consistency in the two stories, sounds like to me. <laughs> yeah, yes, yeah. She disappeared a few times, so we didn't know where, where she Who knows? Maybe she was off meeting up speaking to Charles. Well, before the new movie hit theaters, uh, some of those movies that Jim and Frank were involved in were hitting theaters again. And my wife and I actually went and saw The Muppets Take Manhattan again in November. And it was so much fun. Have you had the chance to watch the film recently again and kind of reminisce about it all? I've seen it on video. A friend of mine that lives in New York said there's a theater in New York that plays it every Christmas Eve. Oh, really? At midnight, yeah, and it's kind of a cult thing. I haven't seen it in a big theater, but I have seen it on the small screen. Um, They play it quite a bit, so I think because it was the first movie where they introduced Muppet Babies, it was very popular for that, as well as the fact that Kermit and Miss Piggy get married by a real priest. That's right. Do you have any pictures or costumes or anything to set that you were able to keep with you? Yes, I do. I have um, photographs. They didn't let me keep the costume, but Jim would send me, he sent me a um, Kermit the Frog as the Blue Boy um, porcelain figure that I guess they made very few of those. And a few other gifts that I have kept. Um, I've also kept the pictures and all from the opening, the program, and, and all sorts of the press release stuff. So I have quite a bit of that, but I wish I had my waitress suit. I don't know if you've had an opportunity to go to many uh, fan conventions, but if you go to enough of those, there's liable to be someone who shows up that made one for you. <laughs> oh, right. I know. Yeah, that's true. most important thing to me is I have a big poster that's signed by Jim Henson and uh. um, Frank Oz and Dave Laser, the producer. That's like my favorite thing that I have, signed in gold by them. Wow. That's awesome. Well, do you uh, still run across a lot of Muppet geeks like me who still talk to you about playing Ginny? You know, it's funny. I run across people that I'll say, oh, yeah, I was this in this movie. You know, maybe your kids would like it. And then they, they're they like the age when the movie came out. They were little kids, and they're like, oh, my God. <laughs> so um, that's kind of fun. And yeah. um, it's just great to be in a film that's such a great film for kids. I just, I mean, and adults. But sure, yeah. But it's just this kind of beautiful film that is the world is a beautiful place yeah you know it's it's just so nice to be a part of that because that's kind of who i am inside i'm the ultimate optimist about everything and so it's kind of great to be in the ultimate optimist movie which is that film 
Well, absolutely. Well, in recent years, you know, you, you uh, went back to school and received two uh -huh. master's degrees in design uh -huh. and geology, and, gemology. Uh, geology. Yeah. What inspired you to pursue those fields and go back and get those degrees? Really, it was, I was working as an actor, but the business has changed tremendously from mm -hmm. when I started. And um, I did a lot of theater, and I did Broadway. I did all sorts of things. I did a lot of TV shows out here and some films. And I just found that the business had changed so much that I wasn't really getting the same pleasure that I had gotten before. With cable TV and all sorts of these news stations, they figured out ways not to pay actors, and it's just become very difficult. And mm. I was feeling also because of, all the changes and fears of the economy and everything, a lot of the stuff that was being done, the real innovative stuff, were the low-budget movies that, you know, they could pay you a dollar a day. So you can't really survive on that. So I decided to um, try to see what else I liked, and I really liked being creative. So the design thing was easy, um, and um, I took a class for fun, a beating class, and I wasn't really that crazy about the beating, but for some reason I got fascinated about things that come from the earth, these natural things, and mm -hmm. the more I started studying about that, the more fascinating that became, so I kind of decided to combine two things, you know, 360 degrees different from acting, but in a lot of ways it's not, because the things I design, I try to have kind of a narrative to them, and I try to have them be, kind of have emotions, and also be all these things that I learned in acting, so kind of interesting that I had that path that I can bring into um, design now. Well, and it gives you another creative outlet. Exactly. And I still get calls on occasion to um, do uh, low-budget movies and everything, but um, if I can work it around my schedule, I'll do it. But a lot of it's been very difficult to, to try to um, juggle the two. I'm doing a website. Um, a lot of my pieces, for some reason, um, are animals, mm -hmm. <laughs> and I have lots of frogs. They don't really look like Kermit, but I haven't done a pig yet, but that's definitely on the agenda. Okay. And, yeah, I'm getting my website together, and I'm going to try to have an e-commerce thing on there so people can buy pieces there as well, just to make things easier. So, yeah, and I'll email you when it's up, but okay. I call it Atelier de Chichis, which means the workshop of fuss. Very nice. Well, we look forward to seeing that. And yeah. tying back to my question earlier, being a Muppet geek myself and a big fan of the Muppets Take Manhattan, I was very excited to get the chance to talk to the woman who played Jenny. So, Juliana Donald, thank you so much for uh, being on the program. And all the very best to you in the future, especially with some of the new things you're pursuing these days. That's great. Thank you so much. It was great to talk to you. <laughs> 